Part One. You will hear a student and an advisor talking about facilities at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to five. Hi, I wonder if you could help me. I'm starting a course at Glenfield in a few weeks. I was just a bit worried about what facilities there will be, and what I'll have to do. I'm especially interested in health and welfare stuff. Certainly, we normally send out a copy of our leaflet, staying healthy at Glenfield. I'm not sure why you haven't had it. Well, could you answer a few questions for me? Firstly, I'm wondering about how I get a doctor when I arrive. Well, you can register with the University Health Centre on North Campus. And do I have to pay for that? Not to register, but if you have to get medicines, there's a prescription charge of six pounds fifty. Okay. Well, I'm not planning to get ill. That's only going to arise if I have any problems. So, should I just go along when I arrive? That's what we recommend for peace of mind. But it's not compulsory. And if you don't live inside the catchment area, you can't, in fact, register there. Where do you live? Well, at the moment, I'm staying at the Backpackers Hostel in Hill Street. But I will be moving from there shortly, somewhere nearer. Well, there's a map at the centre which shows you the area that the university practice can accept people from. It's what we call the yellow zone. If you live outside that area, you have to find another medical centre to register with. It sounds like I'll only qualify after I move. I think you might be right. Then, in addition to the health centre, there's a free counselling service for all students situated on the north campus. You don't have to register. They also have drop-in sessions. I say it's free, but that's only for up to eight sessions. Beyond that, they normally refer people elsewhere. Sounds serious. Well, it's not just for big problems. People go there for advice on housing, workload, whatever. Really, they can even arrange financial help.、Mm. Uh, is it confidential? Absolutely. Then again, a lot of students prefer to phone the nightline service, which is run from an office on the central campus. They don't really encourage people to drop in. I see. So it's basically a free phone line. The number, if you want to make a note, is o nine hundred seven six two five nine one three. I'll say it again: o nine hundred seven six two five nine one three. Fine. Well, I hope I won't need any of these. What I will want is access to some gym facilities. Right. Well, you'll find those on the south campus in the sports centre. It's great, but it's not free. You have to present your student card and pay a fee of twenty-two pounds to get a pass. But that will last you for the whole year. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Is this information on the website? I'm afraid not. I can send you some leaflets, or even resend the whole information pack if you give me your details. Uh, could you send the whole information pack, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll have to take down some details. Could you tell me your full name? Sonia Orr. S O. N Y. Uh, no. I'll spell it. S O N I A. Then, or is O R R. Or. Okay. 
And you said you were on Hills Road? Yes, but don't send it there as I'm about to move. I'll give you my new address, which is 22 Winter Gardens. That's Glenfield. And the postcode? Oh, yeah. That's GF23 9BQ. Fine. Now, we're doing a bit of data collection about who uses our services at the moment. Can I just ask a few more questions? Yes, that's fine. OK. If you're an international student, what country are you from? I'm from Switzerland. And how old are you? I'm 24. And finally, which course are you enrolled on? Right. Well, that's a bit complicated, since I'm hoping to switch to economics and history. But at the moment... I'm down to do economics and sociology. It's a joint degree. OK, I'll put that. Great. Well, I'll pop the information pack in the post, and you should get it soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear two undergraduates doing a research methods course. A girl called Leela and a boy called Jake having a seminar with their tutor. Now you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e. try it out for yourselves. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well, the article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback, you know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. So how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete. Old-fashioned, even, even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. 
So you designed a shorter version? Yeah. Then we sent it to the 40 students by email and got 28 replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. I mean, the responses were well written. You know, people had taken a lot of care. But I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what results did you get? Well, basically, the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words, which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No? Okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? There were lots of similarities, but... Uh... There were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam. Whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said they'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision and so forth. Right. So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time-consuming. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. And of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were. And that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely. We got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project, I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well... It's obviously been very successful. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, 
To tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language. Well, the 150th edition has just come out. It sold 32 million copies. Yes, that's right, 32 million. What is it? Roger's thesaurus. Now, Roger's thesaurus is a type of dictionary in which words with similar meanings are grouped together. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language, but what do we know about the man himself? Well, Mr. Roger, or to give him his full name, Peter Mark Roger, was a very interesting man indeed. He grew up in London. He was French, and he spent his early life in a French community there. He later travelled all the way from London to Edinburgh to study medicine at the university there, and graduated when he was 19 years old. And he later went on to become a founder of Manchester Medical School. So his life focused around his career as a doctor. Well, actually, no. Roger had a very wide range of interests indeed. In fact, he was a writer and wrote about many topics such as bees. The kaleidoscope, and even perception and feeling in animals, and he was an inventor too. In fact, in 1814, he invented an early version of the slide rule. The slide rule? Yes, the device that can calculate numbers. Then, ten years later, he developed a prototype for the cine camera, and he also got involved in a range of different projects. For example, he became head of a commission investigating London's water supply, and he developed a method of water filtration through sand. And he was involved in the area of education. He was one of the founders of London University. And do you play chess by any chance, Mark? Yes, I do. Well, Roger invented the travelling chess set. So next time you're playing a game of chess on a train, you have Mr. Roger to thank. So. How did he actually find the time to classify the English language? Well, he only turned his full attention to the thesaurus when he retired, and that was when he was in his seventies. So, what inspired him to write the thesaurus? Well, Roger believed that he should bring as much happiness and knowledge to the greatest number of people. So, during his career as a doctor, he gave free treatment to patients who couldn't afford to pay. We also know that he set up a clinic to help poor people to recover from operations and serious illnesses. Basically, he wrote the thesaurus to help people learn. He aimed to help those who needed practice in writing. He believed that writing skills would help people become more independent and lead happier lives. How popular is the thesaurus today? Well, it was first published in 1852, and it has never been out of print since. In fact, the book has become more popular with each edition that comes out. The invention of the crossword puzzle in 1913 certainly helped to increase the sales figures, though. I think the main reason why it is so popular is that it's thematic, so you can come across words that you've never even thought of when you began looking for the word in the first place. Thanks, Cindy. Now join us again after this short break when I'll be talking to Derek Spode, chairperson of East Anglian News. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank、you